Good morning. I'm Diane Smith-Gander, the National Chairman of CEDA. Let me welcome you all to this next session of our inaugural Digital Forum, State of the Nation. Let me acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. As I said yesterday, the middle of our Indigenous leaders is certainly being tested by the pandemic. The balancing act of protecting the excellent health, health outcomes they've achieved within their community with their community's very strong desire to use the moment of Black Lives Matter to underscore Indigenous and disadvantaged in Australia is a difficult one. So I wish them well with their leadership. CED is an independent member-based think tank celebrating this year 60 years of bringing audiences together to discuss and debate how to achieve better economic, social and environmental outcomes in Australia. I'm delighted that yesterday the Prime Minister said that we're well placed to inform the policy debate on our future. We're also delighted that CETA members have so enthusiastically supported us as we've moved to different forms of engagement. We're excited with the new models that have come out of this enforced change. My role today is to facilitate this session on Australia's evolving labour market. We'll consider the current state of the market, the effectiveness of government response, the implications of policies related to skills development and talent attraction and the likely longer term impacts and the future of our market. There'll be a discussion between our panels and then I'll facilitate some questions to them. So to get your questions on my list, please use Pigeon Poll. You'll find the details on the live stream web page, but if you go to cedar.pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode SON2, you'll be in Pigeonhole. That's capital S, capital O, capital N, and the number two. Also in Pigeonhole, you're going to find a poll question. I'll uh, announce the results of that towards the end of our session, and we will be using it in the wrap up. So we'd really appreciate it if you would be able to fill out that uh, particular poll. The question relates to JobKeeper and your views on how important continued support is after it gets to September. You can also engage with the discussion which will unfold on Twitter, follow CEDA, that'll make it easier, at CEDA underscore news and participate using the hashtag SON2020. I think Australia's employment laws have always been the cause of much debate but never uh, as much as in late 2019. Then the onset of COVID-19 through a circuit breaker. Our employment laws were not prepared for a pandemic. No one expected them to be. So as far as silver linings go, this could be the silver lining of all silver linings for our economy. Today, we have a unique opportunity to hear from the two key players who will shape our future employment laws. And what's really unique is we'll hear how they react not only to each other, but also to the leader of a significant business who will be heavily impacted by where those laws land. His business employs around 30,000 people across most industry sectors on all types of employment arrangements. There are over a thousand apprentices and trainees in this group because the business is involved with areas of the economy where future demand for workers is challenging, things like warehousing. They also use a lot of skills with increased demand, like healthcare. Operating under 108 awards, with a further 54 active agreements, it shouldn't surprise any of us that this business is vitally interested in how our labour market evolves. Now, what I've asked each of our panellists to do is to speak for a couple of minutes uh, before we turn to our discussion, and I'm going to introduce them in turn before they do that. So first, let me turn to Christian Porter, who has been Australia's Attorney General since December 2017. And since the 2019 election, added industrial relations to his portfolio, as, uh, as well as becoming leader of the House. I think that translates to busy. He's focused on modernising Australia's national security laws and reforming Australia's family court system, but now naturally the COVID-19 pandemic is taking his focus. Christian started out as a minister in my home state of Western Australia, holding the portfolios of Attorney General, Minister for Corrective Services and spent a time as Treasurer. He's a self-confessed sci-fi geek who says there's a great deal to be learned from Star Wars. Like when Yoda says to Luke, always your eyes on the future, never your mind on the here and now. I think that makes you Luke Christian, but who is Yoda? So over to you, I say. 
Thank you very much, Sam. That's an excellent introduction. It uh, makes me want to go home and watch a few episodes, but for people who haven't seen The Mandalorian, uh, it's fantastic Disney Channel, We're well worth getting. Uh, look, I think I'll be very brief because I think the more interaction we can get, the better, but I, I guess the reason we're all here on this panel and the reason why the government has set up the working groups that it has is, in my mind at least, but I think there'd be broad agreement on this, that the enormity of the task that we now face is at times difficult to comprehend. And I think that for anyone, and I think that there are probably few, but for anyone who thinks that that what we have just experienced has presented a set of circumstances that are just going to naturally write themselves in a, in a quick or swift or easy way, that would be a terrible mistake. And, I mean, we've lost sort of in a sense formally 600,000 jobs to date. Uh, we've seen now 1.6 million people go on to job seeker, so onto the standard welfare payments. That's an increase of about 800,000 in recent months. We now have over 3 million employees and 800,000 businesses participating in the job keeper program. And obviously some of the jobs that are being supported through what is effectively a wage subsidy are going to be sustainable, which we all hope for. Some of the jobs that are being supported through that wage subsidy are not going to be sustainable in the long run. So there'll be a shift between job keeper and job seeker at some point and to some degree. But however you choose to globally measure the scale of the unemployment problem that we have, um, I think it's something that we can safely say is totally unprecedented in any of our lifetimes. COVID's been a one in a hundred year event uh, and we're not going to get our way out of this without enormous effort on the part of government, uh, industry, uh, the union movement and as much cooperation and agreement that we can engender throughout that process I think is worth the attempt because that's in the best interests of Australians who want to save their job or who want to see job growth uh, increase so that they've got a new job to go to if the present job is unviable. And as the Prime Minister has said, I mean, it's going to take two years for us, things going well, to get us back in the position we were in, and then several years after that to get us back to the point where our growth trajectory would have taken us had these remarkable events not occurred. So that's the sort of context, I think, that's framing the, the cooperation. We've established five working groups. I might just talk very quickly about one, maybe two of those. Uh, one of those working groups is about what's known as Greenfield Agreement Science. So you, you and I obviously and others will be very familiar, a lot of those in WA. But I think one of, one of the things that I find quite remarkable is that um, things are enormously challenging. They could have actually been so much worse were it not for the automatic stabilising effects of some of the industries that have proven quite resilient. Construction's one, mining oil and gas is another. And so if you have a look at um, mega projects like Chevron's Wheatstone natural gas project in WA, so the estimates have been that that creates 30,000 direct and indirect jobs out to 2040 at a rate of 1,000 jobs a year. Uh, 180 billion to GDP. So likewise, uh, Woodside's Burrup Hub natural gas project, that's estimated to support 4,000 full-time jobs per year over the life of the project of 40 years. So 4,000 jobs a year for 40 years. So these mega projects, and I think also the construction industry on the East Coast, which has managed to, to keep moving through the COVID pandemic, not at perfectly the rates that it was, but nevertheless still keep moving. These have had this stabilising effect on that unemployment picture that I've just painted. And that stabilising effect has been unbelievably helpful and things could have been very considerably worse had those projects not been there, had those jobs not been baked into the economy. So just to use the one example of one of the working groups which is looking at this issue as to whether or not we could, through a process of agreement, consultation, compromise, work out a way to have enterprise agreements over the life of those projects or near to the life of those projects rather than the four-year maximum when some of these projects take 8, 10, 12 years to construct. I think that's a conversation really worth having. 
what people in the industry will say is that there are many reasons why construction costs in Australia are far in excess of other ju comparable jurisdictions. Um, enterprise agreements is one of those issues. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. So if it, that is one that we can address, then that is well worth having the conversation because those projects have created an automatic stabiliser, which have helped a situation that could have been much worse without them. And now over the next several years, a really big task for us is how do we attract more of that type of investment, get them through banking feasibility stage, get the construction commenced and have those jobs again baked into the economy as a growth sector of the economy. And obviously we'll be looking at other growth sectors and there's opportunities that will probably not thought of in manufacturing and a range of other areas. So I think that the process that we're about to embark on is well worth it. I think it's entered into in good faith. Uh, we'll obviously see how it goes, but I think it'll be a busy couple of weeks and months for all those involved. And again, thanks to CEDA and for everyone participating in this online forum. Thanks, Christian. Let's turn to Sally. Sally started her life as, working life as a shop assistant, a pizza hut driver and a cleaner before moving on to get a first class honours degree in philosophy. She was a trainee union organiser and represented blue collar water maintenance workers, airline employees and community sector workers. In 2017, she became the 10th elected ACTU secretary, the first woman to hold this position in the organisation's 93 year history. In her spare time, she boxes, she bird watches, and she plays sniper video games. And I have to tell you, when you combine all of that with her day job, it makes for one of the most interesting feeds in the entire Twitter sphere. I can recommend it. Over to you, Sally. Uh, thanks, Diane. Um, I think it's right to start pretty much where um, both you and, and Christian did around the current pandemic, the both the the effect on it really for employers and for workers and you know, just reflect on the the sacrifice that has had to be made in terms of loss of jobs and also incomes over, you know, a period of a short period of time. And for that reason, we're very focused on doing everything we can as a country and playing our part in it in terms of uh, uh, avoiding a second wave because, you know, we're looking closely at what's happening overseas and the the implications of, well, the effect of having um, a second wave is sort of almost unthinkable in terms of having to go back to um, where we've been, especially where the rest of the country is coming out of um, lockdown. So for us, that means um, really focusing on what our country's done really effectively. So that's um, being able to identify um, people that are infected, be able to track and to isolate. And there's a real role for um, workplace laws there in terms of supporting those people who um, might be sick or think they're sick so they go get tested. Now we've got our infection rates so low, we're able, we've got the luxury of having this particular um, ongoing strategy, which we may need to have for a long time, for, for years, in order to keep suppressing it. So. Um, uh, we, we think that we've got to be careful not to get ahead of ourselves and to think, okay, it's all over, um, therefore uh, we can just go back to normal. There is really no normal uh, until uh, we have a vaccine and that we don't want to be in a position where there's further damage to businesses, to jobs, to, to incomes because we're um, because we don't um, put in place the things that we could put in place now in order to avoid this. So that that's where I'd like to start because I think it's important not to get ahead of ourselves. Um, secondly, I, I wanted to go to um, Diane what you said in the beginning about you know our our industrial relations system, like how could it respond to a pandemic, and and what Christian said about it being once in a hundred years, which it is of course because it was 1919 when we had the last one um, pandemic. Well. Actually, our industrial relations um, system did respond and it responded quickly, um, efficiently, um, and in ways where there was built-in protections for, for workers. So there's been a lot of temporary changes to awards. There's been also changes to the Fair Work Act that allowed it to be able to respond to what are totally extraordinary circumstances um, with protections, so also protecting workers as well. And you can see around the world in places, in countries where there aren't those protections, just what a disaster it is. People have just been 
thrown onto the street. There's no job keeper in places like the US, really very few um, employment protections, as you can see, and, and the results like a terrible one. So in a way, um, whilst a, a lot of people will want to say there's all these problems, well, we're never going to be under as much, um, the system will never be under as much stress as it has been for the last um, three months. And the fact it was able to respond, respond in a way where we we're also cooperating, you know, unions and employers and the government um, to, to make that happen is something we sh should actually be proud of and not um, not not dismiss as well. Um, going forward, uh, one of the things I think in terms of the discussions that are going to be had is it's important not to conflate the current situation where we're only just trying to come out of in many places industry has been shut down um, and, you know, the devastation in terms of jobs and incomes um, and that extraordinary, you know, once in a hundred year circumstance with what might be needed into the future and into the future actually was only three months ago. So three months ago, and the union movement believes that we had structural weaknesses in our in our system and that we would um, like to see those addressed. And I suppose, therefore, we're talking about um, what needs to be in place in the future. If we let um, these discussions get um, uh, coloured or affected by um, uh, the, the current situation, we're also, we would then be building solutions that are really um, crisis solutions to... Um, a situation that we find ourselves in now. I accept what Christian says around um, not assuming that everything's just going to come back to normal and, you know, in a few months' time it'll be like nothing happened. Like, clearly that's not going to be the case and that needs to be acknowledged. But at the same time, um, we have to... Um, uh, the, the union movement really won't have a lot of patience if some employers um, come and say that they want changes because of the current situation and for those to be permanent for into the future, wherever that be, whether it's six months or two years or wherever, that we bake in um, what will be in effect, you know, wage cuts or less rights um, for working people and we've got to hand those on to the next generation. It's, it's not something that not only would we not support that, I don't think the country would support it. Like it's, it wouldn't be the way forward. So. I think it's important for us to to acknowledge, yes, we are in this crisis situation, but not get the two things um, mixed up as well. And so uh, I think there's a discussion to be had about the, the current situation. And um, as also the Attorney General said, it's different in different industries. So um, some industries have been very um, well resilient, well able to um, keep working and, um, you know, keeping the economy going in, in many ways, like in the resources area and construction. Uh, but you think about those that have been most hard hit out of this. Well, it's women and young people, really. It's, you know, obviously the hospitality industry, the retail industry, arts and entertainment. Um, and that we also mustn't forget that um, if our response is entirely about, well, we've got a, a pink recession and we need to respond through blue collar jobs. Uh, well, are we really addressing um, uh, what's what's actually happened? So. I guess what I'm saying is that we would we would like to have a discussion that focuses on how do we make our country stronger and better so that working people know um, when they're discussing changes in the workplace with their employers that they um, feel and they are fairly sharing in um, their company doing well because, of course, every worker wants their employer to do well. And so it's where they stop sharing in doing well where you, you cooperation breaks down. And so... We can find better ways of of doing that. That would be that would be good. And the second thing for us is about um, um, a, a strong uh, belief, which I think has unfortunately been borne out during the pandemic, that we've had far too many insecure jobs in our country, and that's a weakness. It's a weakness not just for individuals and their families, but for the whole economy. Um, and where we're going to be depending uh, for quite a while now on domestic spending and confidence in the economy going forward. One of the key things will be is making sure that people have confidence to spend. That goes to two things, whether or not um, if you're in a job that you feel as though you're going to be able to rely on it as much as anyone can rely on any job. And secondly, that we don't make the mistake 
that um, we've made in the past as a country and other other countries have made of of um, going down the path of wage cuts that um, we believe will be a total disaster um, not just for individuals but in terms of an overall economic response thanks very much sally um glenn grew up in a middle class family where all the boys did apprenticeships and went to tech um, and so that's given him a really strong understanding of all backgrounds. My dad was apprenticed as a boilermaker and mum was in a typing pool, so I, I, I get that dynamic. Um, and so I talked before about the 30,000 people at program who are going to be the beneficiaries of the fact that Glenn can shape a pretty unique culture, um, one that's, you know, driven by the values of the company, care, empathy, equality and recognition of contribution from everyone at all levels. So, Glenn, tell us your thoughts on what you've heard from Sally and Christian so far and, and where you think uh, this thing is heading. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Diane. And I uh, certainly agree with uh, everything that Sally and, uh, and the Minister said. I, I, uh, firstly, I think it's great to see that uh, government and unions have come together in a crisis. I think it's exactly what's needed and in everyone's interest uh, to make sure that we maximise job opportunities at, at this point uh, and going forward. Uh, as a major employer across most industry sectors, uh, we see firsthand the challenges of industrial relations and employment systems that are, I guess, steeped in history and, uh, and at times don't reflect the modern work patterns and considerable societal changes that we've seen over the past decades. So we're really looking forward to what uh, what can come out of these working groups that the government have put together. And I think uh, it's terrific to have everyone's contribution. I agree with Sally's points about the, the, the challenge for uh, all of us to ensure there's no second wave. Uh, and it, it's a difficult one because this is a first for all of us, of course, as is uh, coming out of a pandemic, a pandemic and dealing with the easing of restrictions. For business, I think it's difficult to uh, see that you know 50 or 100 people, depending on the state you live in, are allowed in a in a hotel, for example, or a gathering, and then maintaining social distancing in the workplace. Uh, but I agree with Sally; it is absolutely critical for us to uh, hold firm on that, and we talk about that in uh, that program also about uh, maintaining standards. I think that's very critical because a lot of the discussions at the moment are about creating jobs. The last thing we want to do is go backwards. Uh, I think creating demand and confidence right now is obviously critical to get businesses investing again. Uh, the federal and state government announcements about various stimulus packages uh, have been very welcome. Uh, I think private employers, particularly uh, large firms, also need to play our part by encouraging investment and taking advantage of offers such as instant asset write-offs and stimulus packages to keep things moving. Uh, despite the challenges facing business, it's not the time to put off work that really needs to be done anyway. Uh, our shared challenge at the moment is to create jobs uh, now and over the next uh, 12 months or so. I agree with uh, uh, Christian Porter's comments there around you know, a, a difficult you know, 12 or 18 months uh, uh, facing us. Uh, I think uh, for the many unemployed people who find themselves, many of them find themselves facing they, uh, something they've never faced before. I think unions and government and, uh, and industry can work really well towards some innovative and practical solutions if we have an open mind uh, of, and a new way of doing things. Uh, I've certainly noticed more than ever before that this government's willing to listen and gather ideas from you know, a broad range of, uh, of outside parties. Uh, I think it's important to recognise there are quite a few complexities to uh, the problem of getting people back to work. There are varying groups of unemployed with different needs. Uh, for example, school leavers need to be supported through work and training and uh, in different ways to someone who's over 50 and you've lost a job in a field they've been in for you know, 30 years or so. This is our challenge, I think, uh, developing uh, support for people who have found themselves out of work and, uh, and, and absolutely drumming up some confidence and uh, private industry stepping up to the mark also. Yeah, Glenn, it's interesting that you finish with that particular comment. One of the questions we've had that's come through from Anonymous, who is a prolific contributor to Vision Hole, um, is actually exactly that. Where is the voice of the unemployed? Who will or how will we ensure 
unemployed people are represented in these reform negotiations. So I'll be really interested in each of our panellists' view on how that might happen. Sally, what, what do you think? Um, how do we get some of that focus? Um, uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, an unemployed worker is still a worker. They're just at that particular time unemployed. So, um, and certainly a lot of our members and in industries that, that you know, are well unionised and ones that aren't, um, you know, a whole lot of, uh, of our people are now unemployed. So I don't think that we necessarily take that whilst the, the, the groups are looking at the Fair Work Act, um, you know, they may have other discussions that, that go to those other areas because there is an interrelationship um, between them and also especially if we're um, focused on what we could be doing in terms of um, skilling up people at times that they are going to find themselves unemployed. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Glenn, what's your view? And, and with that skilling up piece, um, you know, how quickly can you skill up? I mean, this is, I know, a real focus of the program. Uh, yes, yes, it certainly is. I think, Diane, the, 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 a lot's been said over recent years about, uh, I guess, the uh, focus on university education and the declining, uh, I guess, funding and popularity of the vocational uh, type uh, roles. I think that uh, there was a great review done by uh, Stephen Joyce in uh, 2019 that, that put together some short-term and long-term uh, changes to make sure that we get more people in uh, learn-as-you-go type uh, traineeships. I think that's part of the solution and uh, making sure that we take some of those recommendations, which back then seems a long time ago, the late 2019 recommendations were long-term and get them very quickly uh, put in place to free up that system and create traineeships where there's a strong connection between the training and a job uh, in new new roles, new skills, and certainly new industries. I think that's one of the keys to getting things moving much faster. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Christian, you did make the comment that we're going to see people come from job keeper to job seeker um, when there are jobs that prove to be unsustainable. Um, Hopefully, our economy will continue to surprise us on the upside and be more resilient. But I do agree with you, and I think most business people are in the same boat, that there are going to be some jobs that just will not be sustainable in the future, and particularly some smaller businesses that may have uh, found that struggle a bit much. So how are you thinking about this question of the voice of those um, unemployed people who will be on job seeker? Yeah, so, and of course, the government's task, first and foremost, is to minimise that, that shift as much as possible. I and mean, everything we've done has been about trying to preserve jobs. So JobKeeper was about keeping a bridge of connectivity between employer and employee where a, a particular business had experienced a fall down in, de, in demand because of COVID and the government responses to COVID. So the 30% turnover was the marker for that. But of course... Our job is to try and make sure that as many of those businesses that have been under stress over this period of six months towards the scheduled end of JobKeeper can, can regrow, uh, keep existing staff and rehire, that it would seem a virtual impossibility that that number can be reduced to zero. Uh, but we want to get it as close to that as humanly possible. So that question that Anonymous asked has been asked to me so repetitiously and in exactly the same linguistic form that I feel almost like I know who Anonymous is, but I won't out, have a go at outing them. But it's a, it's a great question because, of course, I mean, from the government's perspective, the, the primary group of people we're trying to represent here are people who either have found themselves without a job or are in jeopardy of losing a job because of the extraordinary circumstances we've been into. So what is the best solution to that? Things, policies, changes to skill settings, which is outside our working group, but nevertheless a focused government that can create job growth. Um, so it's a very hard thing to represent 1.6 million unemployed people and, and millions of people whose, whose jobs are in jeopardy because of the extraordinary circumstances we're in. But certainly it's first and foremost in the government's mind. And I, I take what Sally says again with um, just on, on good faith. And obviously the union movement sees that a range of people, particularly in hospitality, tourism and retail, where the effects of the pandemic are going to be lingering with it for some period of time. 
particularly given that we're likely to have international borders closed, which decreases demand in tourism and associated industries. So Sally's got a whole range of people, again, young people and women, often young people in, in first jobs, that have jobs that are teetering. And that's, that's the reality. So this process is part of a much wider process to try and stabilise those jobs as quickly as possible, regrow jobs in those industries and other industries, allow enough flexibility through reskilling for people to move between those jobs. But again, I'd come back to my initial point, the idea that, that things will return seamlessly to the way they were um, you know, six months after JobKeeper commenced is, is just a, a false apprehension and we have to plan ourselves and work ourselves out of this, not just hope for the best. Yeah, I mean, it's such a visceral thing, isn't it, the relationship that you have. I'll pop up about three times. I've had a job since I was 12. Sally, sorry, I did start work before I was legally supposed to, but I was always tall and looked older than I was. Um, and I worked, you know, all the time until about 10 years ago, I went through a nine-month period when I didn't have a job. Um, and I was distracted in many other ways. I had a terminally ill father at the time. But still, it really cut to the core of me, you know, not having a job. So we've had our poll and we've asked our very large audience um, the question, how essential do you feel continued government support will be for you and your workforce as programs like JobKeeper come to an end? So yesterday, as I told you, we had 50% of people sitting on fence. Um, okay, here, um, only 7.5% of people are sitting on the fence and not sure. 15% of people said it won't help much or it won't help their business at all to have continued government support. 17.5% said it'll help a bit. 60% said it's really going to be the thing. And I think that's a bit of a frightening statistic. And I don't know whether that's a confidence statistic, uh, but I'll be very interested in each of your reaction to that. Um, is this about confidence? Does it mean we really have to find a way to extend the support programs or might there be a better option? How can we get jobs moving without it just being about more wage subsidy? Glenn, Glenn what are your thoughts on this? Would you like to have a crack at this first? <laughs> well, of course, mine's just an opinion uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more qualified people than I who have considered all of the implications. Uh, however, uh, my opinion is... Uh, that, that there should be government support continuing for some uh, industries that are particularly hard hit. But largely speaking, I think there's got to be uh, a ripping off the Band-Aid at some point. And I'm not sure that uh, for some industries who are receiving JobKeeper, for example, it's, it's necessarily required longer than currently planned at the moment. So a bit of a hybrid, I think. Thanks, Glenn. Sally, what are your thoughts? Because I, I should go to Christian last on this one, given that he is the government. I think um, what's reflected in those poll results is a bit of a broader thing too about um, what role uh, will the government play or what role do we think they need to play in getting out of the recession? And that, um, uh, you know, clearly the government's going to be the major actor in job creation and job protection. So um, as a country, we're going to rely on our governments to take the initiative. They're the ones that really uh, can create jobs on a much bigger scale. Uh, for example, um, the role of uh, the public sector in particular in regional areas, uh, you know, where you have public sector jobs there in general, um, good jobs in terms of being um, stable ones and incomes that you know that will feed then into that local community, into all the local businesses, into, into um, keeping those communities going. But in general, like being sort of the solid spine of, um, of the economy and spending. So I think that there's a real important uh, role there in terms of um, thinking differently uh, about public sector um, jobs and job creation and the services that then the knock-on effects from that into, into the community, not just in terms of money, but also obviously in terms of service provision. Um, then of all the obvious things around uh, infrastructure and job creation. And again, I'm sure that there's uh, many people thinking through this and what will be the best use of government money. But, um, you know, we're going to need in the end, the government to take the lead to get us out of this as, as they have in um, 
other times when there's been big, big down downturns. In terms of JobKeeper, um, well, it's a similar it's a similar thing really. It's it's part of the role of what our government needs to play in terms of keeping jobs going. We certainly know beyond September that um, the aviation industry is going to continue to be really hard hard hit. Um, I think of Sydney International Airport, one of the biggest uh, in workplaces in, in the whole of New South Wales, probably in the whole of the country. And it's a ghost town, you know, what there's four flights that are coming in a day, and that's it. And you think of all of the yeah, extra jobs there that, that, are, that, are, that are part of that, that's a, a devastating effect. And that, that's not for any reason other than, you know, health reasons. Um, so uh, in that case, how can there not be um, uh, continued support because you know the original idea of JobKeeper was yes keeping people uh, connected to their jobs so that businesses could recover when it was when they could like when when the economy was reopening or um, when demand was returning well um, it's really clear that there's going to be whole big sections of our economy that is still going to be in that situation come September maybe not everyone but um, clear areas like aviation and tourism certainly will be. I see, Glenn, you went off mute. Did you want to add something there or can I go to Christian? What would you no, like? no, I just didn't put my mute on. So. Ah, that's okay. There are, Christian, your thoughts? So, I mean, clearly we're going to have um, a larger role for government in the near future in the economy than we've experienced in the near past. But I guess my assessment of that would be that looking back on all of this since it you know, since the first reports came in and a flu-like symptoms being reported in Wuhan province in late December and early January, this thing has evolved dynamically and fluidly on a, on a weekly basis. I mean, the terms and conditions of what we've deal, been dealing with have changed so quickly and required fast analysis and responses, you know, from government where there will always be imperfections in responses when you're trying to respond that quickly to really dynamic and fluid changing circumstances. But what I think that has shown is that set and forget policies in this really dynamic environment don't work very well. So yes, I mean, there's gonna be a clear need for government involvement and that 60% figure does not surprise me at all. And that's, that, you know, that's part of confidence. It's part of rational assessments of, of demand fluctuations and decreases in a range of business sectors, many of which we've spoken about. But, you know, something that Sally said rings in my ears, and that is how do you make the best use of government money? Although I would phrase it as how do you make the best use of taxpayers' money because there's no such thing in my view of government money. But so how, you know, if you're going to have an involvement, how do you spend that money? Um, and, you know, we've looked already at the 585 million package for skills in Australia. And so there's going to be a range of areas where the government has to make decisions around limited resources and applying them for maximum effect at job survival and job growth. Uh, and I, I think that that's something that requires constant reassessment because it's very fluid. Infrastructure is obviously going to be a big part of that picture. And it's not merely about money. I mean, Sally's completely right about um, the airline industry and tourism. And yet we have state borders closed. So in my state, people can't fly in from Melbourne and have a holiday at Margaret River. And that, you know, is a, is a, has a double crushing effect on top of an industry that was crushed because of the initial responses to COVID. So I think we need to look at this right across the board. We need to try and get maximum value for every dollar of the taxpayer's money that we spend. And that's why JobKeeper is subject and has always been subject to a review. Uh, and what you want to be doing is supporting jobs that are sustainable until um, until you, you make a rational assessment that that's no longer a sustainable position. And you want to ensure that the other ways that you're spending money and skills and infrastructure are growing jobs um, that haven't been there before. But this is a very, very dynamic arrangement and environment. We need to be completely and constantly rethinking everything that we're doing. Thank you very much. Look, I'm so sorry, we are now out of time. Um, there's a lot of questions in the pigeonhole and there's a couple that obviously you're not going to be able to address. 
But I hope everyone who um, has been watching this has come out of this session as encouraged as I am, because I think what we've heard is three very smart people um, with very rational arguments, but also principles and care. Um, and that's what's come across to me. So I think with that, we've got the potential to move forward to the right sort of solutions. People in the pigeonhole are worried about the pink collar recession. I wore my pink collar today for that. So there have been a lot of questions about women and it wouldn't be me if I didn't ask all of you to focus on that area. But a really interesting question we had from Daniel Estran that said, look, we had some significant in, uh, announcements yesterday about infrastructure. Um, are we going to have all the right skills to do that? And where's migration going to fit in and how are we going to continue to use that inflow of people to bring skills into this country? I think that's going to be a really tricky one for us as we've got um, so many people on Job Seeker and Job Keeper. Um, so let me thank all of you for your contribution um, and encourage everyone to stay on for our next session on critical services, which is following right now. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone.